I, I'm going to confess, I, I kind of like the Marvel movies, the, the different Marvel superhero movies. And, um, and that's a tough confession to make because at it, it, it heart, I grew up a, a Superman fan, which is DC Comics. But um, there was a recent Marvel movie out called Captain Marvel. Who saw Captain Marvel? Okay, you guys need to go see Captain Marvel. Come on. Um, I liked Captain Marvel because it, it was entertaining. It was, it was some good entertainment. But there was, I'm always looking for biblical examples and illustrations in movies because movies speak powerfully to us, right? And there was some in that movie, some that I probably just picked out and I'm making up out of my own imagination. I really do think there was some purposeful, you know, there are some movies that they call Messiah movies where they have kind of hidden imagery of maybe the Messiah. And I wonder if something was going on there for you who saw that movie when she finally, Captain Marvel finally realized what her power was. It showed her descending into the water <laughs> and coming back up a different person. Um, so there's a story there, but the, the gist of that movie or, or the scene that I, I really thought was powerful is I'll try to share this in a way that I don't give away too much for those who haven't seen it and want to, is, you know, it's a sci-fi superhero movie, and she is living amongst these other people from another planet, and she thinks she's one of them. She has some power that no one else has, and they've, and these people have convinced her that they have given her that power is kind of an experiment. She's got this little thing embedded in her neck that they've told her is what gives her this power. Well, through a chain of events, you know, her, her past was kind of fuzzy to her. She realized who she really is. And she realizes that this little thing on her neck isn't what gives her her power. These people have been deceiving her that this little thing on her neck was hindering her power. And so when she realizes that, she looks at this kind of the evil mastermind behind all this, and she goes, you know what? I think I've been fighting you guys with one hand tied behind my back. And she pulls this thing off, and then without giving away too much, we see this power come to a whole new level. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then the movie goes on. And, but again, I think there's some neat imagery there on what she went through to realize where the source for power really was and how great it really was. And, you know, I, I think an illustration why I brought that up this morning is, you know, as Christians, we have power. And as a church, as Vista Community Church, we are a church with power. But as I look at the early church and what they did, I can't help but wonder if we're fighting the battle with one hand tied behind our back. And I can't help wonder if we've been deceived by the enemy. <laughs> and we think that what we have <laughs> is all we get. And we don't know the power that is really available to us. So... In your bulletin, I started this off with putting power into practice, but as I put together my slides, I added in there Christianity 101, because this, again, kind of one arm tied behind her back, what, what I'm sharing, I, I think may be new information for some, but this is the basics. This is stuff that we need right out of the gate. This is boot camp. This isn't even our advanced training yet. This is something we need to grab onto to live the life that God's called us to live. So here's what I'm going to talk about this morning. Is we're going to look at a promise for power. We're going to look at a paradigm for power or an example given. I had to find something that went with the P's there, right? Paradigm was as good as I could get. And then the practice of power, our 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 instructions we've been given to put that power into practice. So first, let's look at the promise for power. In Acts 1.8, right 
right before Jesus ascended into heaven, the last time that the apostles saw him, and they were asking him about the coming kingdom, he said, don't worry about that, guys. But here, I got this for you. The Spirit's going to come, and when he does, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. You guys all know that verse. But understand, this is, it's not a command. It's not an exhortation to go do. It's not, a, it's not wishful thinking. Jesus was making a statement of fact. You will receive power. We have, if you're a believer, if, you, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you have the Holy Spirit living within you, you have power. And you're his witness. Good one, bad one, mediocre one, <laughs> but you're his witness. These are statements of facts. They're not commands to go do. We're not supposed to go find this power. We're not supposed to go be. We are. <laughs> we have power, and we're witnesses. So we are a people of power. We are a church of power. And then go down to this bottom verse. As Paul goes in in beginning of the book of Romans, and we're going to spend time today in the book of Romans. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. So not only are we people of power, we've been given a tool, more specifically a sword of power. You know, there's a guy, some of you guys that, you know, I'm going to be 60 years old, so 60 years old this year. Some of you guys have been around uh, as long as me or longer. You've probably heard of a guy named Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell's a Christian apologist. He was an attorney. He was an atheist, and he went off to kind of use his legal skills to go and disprove the God of the Bible. Through the process, he became a Christian. And he became a very strong apologist, a very strong defender of the faith. And somewhere in the mid, late 80s, he was debating a, a, an atheistic evolutionist, and they were talking about creation versus evolution. And it was clear to everyone, it was at a university, it was clear to everybody that, that his, his sound, legal, logical arguments totally blew away the atheistic evolutionist. And as they came to give their closing remarks, you know what he did? He shared the gospel. And afterwards, a lot of his followers said, man, you had the guy down on the mat, why didn't you go in for the kill? And he said something along the line of, you know, guys, people make up all their intellectual excuses and paradigms on why there is no God to cover a heart problem. And I can give arguments all day long, but the gospel is the power. So we had an audience there right for the picking, and instead of going for that one more logical argument, he went to the power. He went to the gospel. So we've been promised power. We are people of power, and we have a tool that is powerful. I do want to share one other great example. Again, late 80s, Angela and I were in South Carolina in school, and along with, uh, I was at Columbia Bible College getting a, a, a theology degree, and and we were working with youth in our church, and I was active with, well, now they call it crew. Back in the day, it was called Campus Crusade. And Billy Graham was going to come to town and do, that's when he was still doing his crusades. Well, his team, he has a team on the ground a year in advance. A lot of prayer, a lot of work, a lot of, you know, just planting seeds and getting ready. And, and we got to be part of that experience. And then when time, a year goes by, and we go to that crusade, and this is at the USC football stadium there in South Carolina. And this place is packed. Packed from people from states around. Packed, there's Fort, the, the Army base there, Fort Jackson? Army base, I believe. Tons of soldiers there, new recruits going through boot. And Billy Graham gets up to speak. And he starts talking, and I'm, I'm like... <laughs> it's not that good. <laughs> I, could, I could do that. It, it wasn't anything fancy with what he said. 
But you know what? He gave an altar call, and this place just descended down there on the stage. Because God anointed him, and he had power. The gospel is power. Well, let's talk about a paradigm for power. Two things it gives it to us in Acts chapter 2. Right after Jesus told him, you're going to have power. Actually, it's about 30 days later, 50 days later. The Spirit comes upon him. At Pentecost, there's this gigantic crowd of people. And let's read this together. But Peter, taking a stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Stop there for a minute, just as a side note. You know, we live in a world today that says it's impossible for a man to be raised from the dead. God's word says it was impossible not for him to be raised from the dead. Because resurrection power was at work. That same power is inside us to live the Christian life. But he goes on, he says, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So the example we're given, first of all, gospel is preached. Second, the gospel is lived. Right after that, still in Acts chapter 2, talked about those new believers, those freshly minted believers, as they, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. So the gospel is lived, and it gives us right here an example of what it means to live out the gospel. Continually, key word there, continually devoting themselves to teaching. They were growing in God's word, continuing, continually devoting themselves to fellowship. They were doing life together. They were loving one another to breaking of bread. They were meeting each other's needs. And then they were continually devoted to prayer. Uh, and we could go on in, again, a whole series on prayer, but I just put there taking all those things and connecting the dots back with God and what God is doing and, and, and the work God is doing in their midst. And what was the result of that? It says everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And the Lord was adding daily those who were being saved. So there's our example. Gospels preach. Gospels lived. Gospel is lived. And what's the results? The people were in awe. In the book of John, he says that people will know we're Christians by our love for one another. And in John 17, Jesus praying to the Father, he says, I pray that they'll be united. Talking about us, that we'll live in unity. He says, so the world will believe that I, Jesus, came from the Father. And those are the two marks of a Christian, that we love each other. When we love each other in power, which we're going to see in a little while, the world will know we're Christians. They'll know there's something different about us. And when they see us united, working together, even through our differences, they'll know that Jesus came from the Father. The powerful part of that is just the opposite. When we're not united... <laughs> The world has a right to say that Jesus is not from the Father. But how 
will they see us loving each other? And how will they see us united with each other if we're not inviting them into us? Well, one, if we're not doing life with each other. Because in that early church, they were continually doing these things, and the Lord was adding to their numbers every Sunday afternoon, daily. Their lives were infused with each other. They were in fellowship with one another. They were breaking bread. They were meeting needs with each other. They were praying with each other. They were at the feet of the apostles being taught, growing in the word every day. They brought people into that. And people saw something supernatural. And they were in awe. So as we move, I want, to, I want to shift gears now into putting that power into practice. And we're going to spend some time uh, going through mainly Romans chapter 12. But in the book of Romans, Romans 1 through 11 is a, starts off with that, you know, Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God. But Romans 1 through 11 is a, actually a pretty deep, kind of sophisticated explanation uh, kind of seminary level explanation of the gospel. And it, it is fairly technical, and you could spend a life studying those 11 chapters. And then chapters 12 through 13, 15 is how to put that into practice. He goes through 1 through 11, explaining the gospel. And in 12, he says, therefore, <laughs> okay, based on everything I've just said, therefore, Go practice it this way, and that's where I'm going to want to spend our time. But before we do, let's talk about that first part of that paradigm. The gospel is preached. You know, it's not just for James. That's not just for Sunday morning. That's for us doing life with the people that God has put in our paths, at work, in our neighborhood, family members. And I think for many... This is an area that we may be living the Christian life with one arm time behind our back. Why is it so hard to share our faith? Why does that scare us? I think there's probably an infinite number of reasons. Three big ones that come to mind for me is, you know, we are both tempted and a little bit afraid. We talked about some singing about our fear of a world system that I'm going to talk about just a little bit. Number two, I think we're afraid we're going to look like hypocrites because we just don't do it right all the time. And number three, we just, we don't think we know how. But let me ask you, if you're, if you're in here and you're a believer, if someone shared with you, if you were smart enough <laughs> And God gave you the ears to hear that, and you accepted it. Don't you think that you're smart enough, and God would give you the mouth to speak it? It was easy enough for you to understand and be saved. It should be just as easy for you to explain it to others. It really should be. I want you to write these five words down in this order. Grace, man, God. Christ, faith. Grace, man, God, Christ, faith. What do they need to know? Number one, that getting right with God comes from unmerited favor from God. It's a gift. Why? Because number two, because man is messed up. We are broken. We are broken beyond repair, and we can't get it right ourselves. Why is that important? Number three, because God, grace, man, God is perfect, and God is holy. And God demands perfection, and God demands holiness. We can't exist in his presence. Number four, Christ. Christ, the God-man. Christ, the man, came and died. He can die for us because he was a man, too. He can die for all of us because he's the infinite creator God. 
And number five, faith. It's a gift that we accept in faith. It's extended to all, but we have to receive it in faith. Grace, man, God, Christ, faith. If you can remember that, you can share your faith. <laughs> okay, you get that down? There's three elements. Number one, how is a man saved or a woman saved? I just told you. Number two, how are you saved? What's your story? And number three, what's the current impact of Christ in your life? And how you share those may be in any one of those three conversations. And that third one, the present impact of Christ in your life, I got a dozen of those in my back pocket. You know, I've lost jobs. I've blown it. I've been betrayed and I've betrayed. I've been hurt and I've hurt. I've buried loved ones. I've been at the bottom. In every one of those situations, God met me. He met me in the shadow of the valley of death. And he showed me one more time where power really comes from. We all have those stories. Have them in your back pocket. Build those relationships. Be that non-judgmental friend that comes alongside family members, neighbors, workmates. Hear their story and be ready with yours. So the gospel's got to be preached. But the gospel has to be lived. We have that example where they gathered for teaching, for fellowship, for breaking bread, and for prayer. Paul spends 11 chapters in Roman sharing his faith, sharing what that faith means. Now he tells us, therefore, how to put it into practice. The first thing he says is, in Romans 12, 1, therefore, present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. I got one for the, I got mine with my notes in it and the other one for the screen. So someone throws something at me when I'm not keeping up. So I think we all know the world has a system. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. When I work with teenagers, I call it gold, girls, and glory. Now I've simplified it. Wealth, pleasure, and fame. Same thing. That's the world system. Wealth, pleasure, and fame. You take those three concepts and you look at the discussion the serpent had with Eve. It was these three concepts. You take those three concepts and you look at the conversation Satan had with Jesus in the wilderness. It was these same three concepts. So if we're going to have that power that God talks about us, the first thing we have to do is give up this whole idea that our self-worth and our value and our success in this life depends on wealth, pleasure, and or fame and present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice. God has a system. John the Baptist, who was the forerunner for Jesus, when Jesus came on the scene and revealed, John said, he must increase and I must decrease. When you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, he must increase, and we must decrease. Jesus said, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever goes tries to find his life and all these things, you're going to lose it. But you lose your life to the world system and you'll find life. The Apostle Paul had some kind of weakness. We don't know what it was. It may have been some type of physical handicap. It may have been some guilt he was harboring over some pre 
Christian actions on his part. We don't know. But he asked God to take it away. And God's response was, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. So Paul says, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Paul goes on to say over in Philippians, he says, all I want to do is know Jesus. And then he gets specific. I want to know him. I want to know the power of the resurrection. And I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. We can't know the power of the resurrection without knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. If I was going to put this down to one sentence, we just got to get out of God's way. Now, to be fair, all through Scripture, we see God partners with us. When God parted the Red Sea, he told Moses, I will lift up my hand. And his next sentence was, Moses, lift up your hand. (laughs) God partners with us. But we have to, the Bible says we have to take off the old before we can put on the new. We can't take this whole concept of wealth and pleasure and fame, and put that on top of God's paradigm. Doesn't work. We have to take it off. And then we go partner with them. How do we discern that? How do we, how do, we do that when we're so tainted with the world system? Romans 12, 2. Did I get ahead? No, I'm good. How do we blow our paradigms up and change our thinking? Romans 12, 2 says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The beginning of that is don't be conformed to the world. Don't stay in that world system of wealth, pleasure, and fame, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, that word transformed The word conform, don't be conformed to the world. Don't be pressed into the world's mold. (laughs) But instead, be transformed. It's where we get our word metamorphosis. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Become something new. Become something completely different. You know, for me to go to a group of human beings and say, you win by losing, (laughs) that... You win by giving, you know, by setting your things on your, your heart and your mind on heavenly things, not on earthly things. Just to, to let Jesus' power be displayed through our weakness. It's like, it's either, dude, you're either misinterpreting that or you just lost your mind. Because the Sunday morning preachers don't preach that. Well, most of them, I got to be fair. But that's no different than telling a caterpillar hiding in the bushes eating leaves that he's supposed to be flying, drinking nectar from beautiful flowers. We're supposed to metamorphosize from a caterpillar into a butterfly. And how? By renewing our minds. Let's look at some other passages. Again, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings. Paul tells Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Timothy, he's commanded him, know your word. Know the word. And then Paul, talking about husband and wife relationship as it looks and is compared to the relationship Jesus has with the church, it says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loves the church. And then it says, in Christ, and he gave himself up to her so that he might sanctify her. He may make her grow and look more like him. That's what sanctify means. Having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. That he might present her to himself, the church, in all her glory. By the washing of the water of the word was the very first thing in our paradigm. 
the apost- the, when people heard it and got saved, they committed daily to the apostles' teaching. What's, her, what's the first thing Paul talks about after he goes through the gospel, Romans 1 through 11? Change your view of the world system, <laughs> and you do that by transforming your mind. So here we have this system before believers, wealth and fame and pleasure is going to give me what I need. Okay? And then we build up a belief system on things that we can do to get that. Got to get the best job. I got to get the best education. I got to lose 40 pounds. I got to, you know, get in my tan for my summer bikini. You don't see me in a summer bikini. Got to get the right girl, get the right guy. All this list of things that we, gotta, that we believe, that we think is going to build, support this world system. And then we have a whole set of actions we do to go do, get those things. And then we have a whole set of emotions that kind of tell us how we're doing with that. God says, blow it all up. Now you've got a world system. You must decrease and I must increase. My power will be perfected through your weakness. And then we start the process of transforming our minds away from that system to a new system and the things we need to be about, which we're going to look at in a minute. And then we find ourselves with a whole new set of habits. That's what we're being called to do here. So as we move on, guys, we must be growing in the Word. And I don't mean Sunday morning devotion with your little make me happy this morning, but those are good. <laughs> but that's not what transforms us. You need to get in the Word. You need to, you need to get some good Bible study books. You need to be part of a Bible study that's teaching the Word and parsing the Word and opening it up. And there's people here who can help you get on that journey. All of our elders are great teachers. And there's, you know, John Eccarino and Alex Wiesar are probably some of the best teachers in this church. Teachers love to teach. Go ask them their help. They're not going to tell you no. They're going to love to get with you in the Word. You got to grow in the Word. talks about back in that paradigm in Acts, they did fellowship together, they broke bread together, they were doing life together. Well, Paul picks right on up in Romans 12, 3 through 8, it says, live in community by humbly using your spiritual gifts. If you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help, don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with a disadvantage, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep that smile on your face. So, in the workplace, I pretty much, op- I, I, I work in IT for a big healthcare system here in South Texas. And my basic mode of operation is a strong belief in the 80-20 rule. <laughs> and you know what? It's, in many cases, that's the case here. And, and, you know, and guys, a lot of times, and there's stuff out there going on I don't know about, but a lot of times, 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. There's a lot of opportunity out there. I think one reason that that's the case, well, there can be many reasons. One of the reasons I hope is the case is maybe you just don't know where to serve or maybe the gifts you see operating here in the church aren't your gifts. You know, some of you are saying, you know, I can do a lot of stuff, but don't stick me in that nursery. Um, you know, maybe somebody said, I can't make coffee, I burn water. Um... But, you know, there's a lot of gifts 
that happen in the church that don't happen inside these four walls. And I think the gifts, and there's, I think, 20-plus gifts mentioned in the New Testament, because I don't think those are the only ones. I think, I think spiritual gifts are probably unlimited. I think those are just the ones that were called out. If you're a believer, God's, if God's Holy Spirit is living inside you, the Holy Spirit has given you gifts, gifts to serve the body. Find out what those gifts are. Start with where's, where's your passion? Where do you see the need? What is the need you see here that's not being met? If you're in a small group, go talk to your small group leader about that. If not, go talk to one of the elders about that. What would it look like if 100% of the believers in this body were using their gifts? I'm telling you, the people would be in awe. I'm going to share a story that I'm a little nervous to share because it's going to be misinterpreted. There truly is no hard feelings here. It was just an experience I had. Four years ago when our grandson Jameson passed away, guys, we were just devastated beyond belief. Through God's grace, we held it together, and it was our prayer that we would be faithful through that. My daughter and son-in-law, Jason and Stephanie, their small group from their church up there in Olympia, Washington, they never left that hospital that I saw. I don't know when and how they ate, changed clothes, slept, took showers. I don't know. Every time I walked out in the waiting room, they were there. And guys, they and that whole church were phenomenal. On a human level, that's what got me through it. And when I came out in the waiting room to tell them Jameson was gone, when I walked out the doors, somehow they knew. They were all up and just rushed me. And when I told them, they just pressed in on me. And they held me up physically, emotionally, and spiritually in that moment. They ministered to my soul in a way I will never, ever, ever forget. And guys, Angela stayed up to help. I had to come back and, and, and get back to work. When I came home, I was in my house by myself. I got two phone calls. Two phone calls. And I'm really, <laughs> no hard feelings there. The feelings that came out of that was a sadness for other people walking in my shoes that don't have the relationship with God that I have that didn't have a chance to be in awe. And that's a gift that you're not going to see in these four walls that some of you have. You know, a lot of people, the last thing they want to do is to be with a grieving person because they don't know what to say. Well, the person who's grieved knows you don't have to say anything. Just be there. And some of you are gifted that way. And guys, there's dozens of gifts like that that don't happen in these four walls that will minister to this body. And when we do life together and when we touch people in the community, when we're pre out there preaching sharing the gospel, and bringing those people here, bringing those people to small groups, bringing those people into our home, and they see those gifts in action, they'll be in awe. I'm getting close here. Put love to work. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on to dear life for good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourself fueled in a flame. Be alert, servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. 
help needy Christians be inventive in hospitality. I lost the slide in there, guys. My apologies. Our love has to work. Guys, I'm convinced that at the end of the day, you know, the Christian life is about wrestling with the reality of how to grow in loving biblical biblical wisdom to help those that God has put in our paths. God gave the Israelites very, very, very detailed rules to live by. And he raised up a bunch of spiritual brats. God gave us a set of loving principles to live by. To grow up to look like Jesus. And for our love to work. It talks about don't burn out. For our love to work. We got to go all the way back to that principle. He must increase, but I must decrease. If my love has motives behind it, if I want to, if if my love is tainted with, you know, wealth, pleasure, and fame, I'm going to be cool if I go do this favor for somebody. I'm going to burn out. <laughs> I have to love from a pure heart. So homework, because this is in the rest of 12 through 15. Romans 13 talks about submitting to the authorities in our life. Tells us to be careful of getting in too much debt so we can be free to go and to do what God's called us to go and do. Tells us to lay aside our old sinful habits and then... Chapters 14 and 50, along with kind of closing remarks, it really talks about how do we love each other in the gray areas. There's just areas in Scripture that talk about the God doesn't say yes or no. He says, <laughs> apply it to your situation. Some people have a past and something that, you know, I, grew, I, I became a Christian when I was five years old. Every now and then, we didn't go to many, but we'd go to some concerts. For us, a concert was a place to go listen to music had some friends who became Christians in their late 20s. For them, going to a concert was where you go get high. (laughs) So they couldn't go to concerts anymore when they became Christians because it represented something to them that they they needed to work work their way out of. For me, it was music. (laughs) I can't go find the verse, thou shalt not go to concerts. So we got to love each other in the gray areas. I got to enjoy my freedom, but not cause my brother to stumble. They need to listen to their conscience, but not judge me in my freedom. And again, the world doesn't do that very good. You know, Jesus said, what's the big deal when you get along on things you agree on? What makes you different when you get along on the things you don't agree on? When we love each other in the gray areas, people will be in awe. So let's review. We have power, and we don't need to ask for it. We need to let Christ's power reign through our weaknesses. We need to be ready to share our faith in the context of relationships. We need to continually stay and grow in God's word It's how God transforms us. We need to participate in biblical community, and we need to love from a pure heart. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And the Lord was adding daily those who were being saved. Let's pray. God, thank you for your power. Thank you for that resurrection power that lives in us. God, let us embrace both 
the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of your sufferings. Let us carry our cross and follow you. And let your power be perfected in us. Let's fight the battle without an arm tied behind our back. And let the people be in awe. Pray in Jesus' name, amen.